Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming on a Friday, on a gloomy cold Friday in February. Um, so today I want to just talk a little bit about map making and maps from the perspective of somebody who's not a geographer, not a cartographer in particular, not somebody even with any formal GIS training. The best I can come up with is that I've worked with GIS trained uh, geographers. So, um, and that basically their enthusiasm for um, the role of maps um, in scholarship, particularly in humanities scholarship, has rubbed off on me. So I myself have become more and more interested in the role that maps play in helping scholars um, to um, interpret um, data um, that they may be uh, gathering or working with in humanities related disciplines, and also um, the, roles that, the role that geovisualization can play in helping a scholar tell the story um, that they're there to tell or to um, kind of demonstrate the analysis that they're trying to put together. So, um, so today I'll talk for a couple of minutes about some digital maps and atlases, which are kind of combinations or layers of maps bundled together to tell a larger story. Uh, in particular, in uh, how I see them working in, um, in digital humanities and social sciences disciplines. Um, and then, um, of course, I will focus in on examples that I think are really cool because they're the ones I love, and so I look at them a lot. Um, and then, if there's time at the end, I'd like to demonstrate two online applications. They're mostly free. My Maps from Google is free, and it does some cool things, and then there are some things about it that I don't like. Um, so I've always been on the lookout for mapping applications and software that do other things. And for a while, I thought I had um, found one in the form of a program called CartoDB. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it. And it used to be free, and it's still free for me. I'm apparently grandfathered in to the full free version because I signed up like two or three years ago. But now, anybody who wants to use it, you have to pay either an individual subscription or there's an institutional subscription option as well. Um, and then Mapbox is mostly free, and it does some interesting things as well. It's not always entirely intuitive, and then, um, but it's also developing a paywall, so it takes you only so far before it starts to ask you to subscribe with a paid subscription. So I don't know where that's bringing it, but there are some other applications out there that I would love to talk about, but there's not enough time today, and they require a little bit more training to get into them. One of those in particular is um, uh, QGIS, which is um, supposed to be a kind of um, open source, freely available ar alternative to ArcGIS. So it lets you do quite a bit of more, um, um, more detailed, it lets you work more with, um, for example, one thing I like about it is it lets you take scanned images, um, illustrative mappings, for example, or hand-drawn maps that once you digitize them, you can um, map them to actual geo-coordinates and kind of um, turn your illustrative hand-drawn map into something that's um, kind of um, accurate in terms of geo-coordination and geo-referencing. So that was one thing I was interested in at one point. Um, uh, and so you, one can imagine in, in a lot of different fields how people's um, illustrative versions of how they understand, for example, landscape or um, other types of geospatial dimensions of their lives, how one could imagine taking those hand-drawn representations and digitizing them and working with them in that software. Um, but um, uh, one way that I was, in particular, just on a tangent, was um, I taught a, a summer institute course a couple of years ago in Alaska, at the University of Alaska, and a lot of the people in attendance uh, were um, from Alaskan Native um, communities and a lot of these people actually were um, going through disputes with the government in terms of land claim and land ownership. And so they wanted to um, work with maps to demonstrate um, endonyms or, or naming conventions for certain uh, landscape features or certain areas of the land to show that these uh, naming conventions had been in place long, long before the US ever kind of claimed its territoriality in the area. So they, they were hoping to build these maps to bring towards um, court cases uh, to try to Claim, reclaim ownership or re reclaim possession of those territories. So I think QGIS for them would be useful. So yes, again, I caution you, I'm not a geographer. I'm just someone who thinks maps are cool. Um, so um, digital cartography, just as a basic definition, it's a process whereby geotag data can be compiled into some kind of data visualization. Um, and early digital maps, in many ways, were much like their paper-based uh, companions. So think of these um, road atlases. Uh, early digital maps kind of mimicked what you saw in the Rand McNally road atlases. Um, 
But over time, uh, what digital geovisualization allows for is multiple geospatial layers to be um, kind of, in, in a sense, layered on top of each other. And you can also, in addition to um, uh, layering multiple different um, geospatial features, you can add other elements such as audio or video or other types of real-time um, information or still images. Those are often what are called mashups in um, online mapping. Uh, and so here's just a very basic uh, example of an interactive map that also offers on-time um, information. Um, this is one I look at all the time because I live in St. Louis and I have to drive over that Poplar Street Bridge to get to work all the time. So what's up with traffic on the bridge? That's just a simple kind of example of real-time information that can be layered on top of other uh, information. So if you look at the legend, it will tell you that red means things are bad. And so every day I look at it, it's red and more red because uh, there's a lot of road work going on there right now. Um, so I have to debate whether or not I take an alternative route. Um, okay, let's see, back to this. Um, and there are some really amazing and inspirational digital maps and digital map collections out there. Here's one that I like to look at sometimes. This is a historical atlas of uh, the United States. So it's an atlas of the historical geography. And you can uh, look at different types of um, kind of research questions that are posed and how they're answered uh, um, visually, geospatially. Um, so if you enter the app, you can take a look at the table of contents, for example. And these are, again, these are historical maps. So they're asking questions about earlier times uh, in the US. So um, plans of cities at earlier times in the US, for example. So New York in 1776. So it, lets, it brings you in and lets you um, specify for certain types of layers and certain symbols and um, uh, information that you want to make visible in that map. And also because it's part of a larger digital humanities initiative. The map is not just a pretty kind of image, a pretty geovisualization, but it's tied to a lot of other questions that scholars are asking about, um, maybe about the history of New York, or what was you know, going on in the city at that point in time, or how growth in New York at various times uh, differed or compares. So that's uh, one of the key points about, um, well, I'll talk about geohumanities in a moment. Of course, maps can't do everything. There's a couple of well-known well -known kind of issues that come up with maps. One is the Mercator projection problem, and that is the attempt to um, force a cylindrical um, or a spherical um, dimension that the Earth is onto a flat surface. So our flat 2D maps necessarily result in a skewing of certain um, parts of the world. Um, so you get misrepresentation of the ratio of land masses or water masses, for example. But, and that actually, uh, some people have argued, can filter into our mental understanding of, of the world. So yeah, country miss sizes. So for example, this is often, uh, this is a companion to that projection problem that um, certain countries are mistakenly led to be viewed or assumed as larger, more powerful, perhaps. You can see all of the inferred meaning that falls out of that. Um, we can sometimes ask too much of maps, too. Here's a case that I read about. Um, so this was a um, Greater Greater Washington uh, blog uh, and map that was um, put here. And the, it kind of washes out in the, the data projection, uh, uh, unfortunately. But if you look here, these are all supposed to be interactive. It really does wash out in the data projection, unfortunately. I can't do it, do it service here. But, um, Somehow it looks a little better on that screen, oh, yeah. unless my eyes are deceiving yeah, me. Okay. Yeah, these are all supposed to be kind of uh, interactive points on the map, but they just look like they just looks like a big blob on the map. So the symbols um, are too overlapping, and it's also um, just gray and white coloring on the map as well. Um, so uh, the person who created this map wanted a kind of quick story or a quick visualization. Um, but for people who went to this blog, they wanted to go in and have a, a closer look at home sales in their neighborhood, and the map didn't allow for that. So it's just the, the case was simply that when this map was published in this blog, a lot of reader comments came back and said, this is a horrible map. We can't work with this map. Um, and so basically there was, a, there was this tension between the author of the map and what the author wanted that map, what kind of story the author wanted that map to tell versus the story that the readers of that map wanted to be able to learn. 
So the author of that map wanted a, just a kind of a quick portrait of home sales in a particular region, and viewers wanted to go in and be able to zoom in, zoom in and interact with that map. So it wasn't successful, and so it was kind of a disaster in that case. Um, and there actually are discussions of kind of when good maps go bad or when maps don't work for viewers. There is a blog here called Cartastrophe, which kind of describes situations when maps don't work out well for viewers. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, map making, as I've said so far, is a type of visualization. Um, you're using images, diagrams, animations to send a message to viewers and make connections. Um, and visualization can help with a larger analysis. Sometimes people, readers, sometimes your reader audience can use that visualization to help make connections and to help buy into the analysis. Um, and it can also facilitate communication as well. So um, yeah, so uh, for, for me, uh, as my life as a linguist, visualization is complementary to my usual modes of getting my analysis across. So a lot of the ways that I typically um, write publications or prepare materials for a conference involve a lot of text data, either text in the form of my prose analysis or text in the form of the linguistic examples. Um, but there have become, there have been more and more times in my research over the past years where really a geospatial visualization helps uh, people to better understand, for example, the region I'm working in and the linguistic uh, diversity in the region at the very, uh, the most basic level. Um, and as I'll show um, in, in a few minutes, um, even more than that, more profoundly than that, um, it also helps me getting a visual, geo-visualization of the region where I work has helped me form hypotheses about how the languages um, are spoken or compete with each other in the part of the world where I work in this very multilingual part of the world. So not only is then um, a digital map a um, interesting companion to the work I do, it actually helps me better understand the research questions that I'm asking and helps me to flesh out the hypotheses that I'm forming. So I'll, I'll show you more about that in a minute. Um, so geovisualization can be useful in all walks of life. So um, my colleague Jessica de Spain uh, likes to use this example. So um, it shows um, basically um, Benjamin Franklin's correspondence uh, maps within, um, between North America and Europe, so who he was corresponding with back when le letters had to physically travel across the world as opposed to, um, we could still map that now through digital communication um, by using, for example, postcodes or um, in which people read their email or something like that. But, and so it's comparing Benjamin Franklin's correspondence map to Voltaire's. And we see a lot of within Europe correspondence with Voltaire, whereas we see a lot of cross-Atlantic correspondence with Franklin. So um, not all visualizations are spatial, um, and not all spatial visualizations are geographic. So you, all, you can have phy phylogenetic, for example, comparisons, which look at family relationships between different classes or categories. So I just wanted to throw that out there as well. Um, but um, when I became more interested in mapping in um, the work that I do, when I started reading around, I came across this um, interesting cross-disciplinary um, mo movement um, that's, at least at the time, was termed geo-humanities, uh, which I thought was um, also quite interesting. So geo-humanities can be defined as a, a zone of um, interaction and integration between geography and humanities. Because traditionally, the idea was that someone might need um, a map maker to make a map for them. And the relationship between the geographer and the, scho the scholar from the other field would be over at that point. Once the map is produced, OK, thank you for helping me. Bye bye. OK, so this idea of geo-humanity says that actually both disciplines really have something substantial to bring to each other. So it's a mashup of space, place, and also humanity subjects and issues. So therefore, the map plays a central role, but it, it also is challenged. So maps themselves become reconceived of, uh, redesigned, um, reimagined. So a couple of non-linguistics examples, uh, one that I thought was kind of um, compelling um, is um, the 9-11 um, attacks in critical geography. So um, artist Laura Kagan, she had a, uh, already had a contract with a satellite company to get images of New York City for a different um, project she was working on. Um, and so she already was getting images of uh, New York City when the 9-11 attacks happened. So she was able to have the, those images. She was able to get them. And so she got them 
four days after the attacks. And what she did with those images is she um, expanded them greatly. I have a picture of them here. So she expanded them to 15 feet um, by 48 feet um, in dimension. So really almost kind of think of like the length of this classroom by about half the width of this classroom. So she took the image and she laid it out on the floor. Um, and so, and, and it, it went to a gallery and people were encouraged to actually walk on the image. She wanted people to stand on it. Um, and it was imposed in wood, yep, and it was, oh, she, it was displayed in Germany. So this is a, a kind of a shot of that map, kind of from the second floor, or third floor of the museum. And so it shows um, the southern, southernmost tip of Long Island, and you can see there the cloud um, from where the World Trade Center buildings used to be there. So this is a couple of days. And, and if, you, if you guys remember 9-11, the weather was fantastic right around the days of it. It didn't rain for until several days after the attacks. The skies were crystal clear and blue. And so um, imagery is very sharp and clear. If it had been a really cloudy or foggy day, she wouldn't have had access to this imagery. Um, so basically, um, her goal here, um, at least in terms of the art theme, was an artistic interpretation and critique of satellite imagery. Um, she, she, um, one of her ideas behind this is that satellite imagery is almost, it's such a bird's eye view of what you're looking down at that you feel removed from what, what you're looking down at. There's this disconnect. And she wanted to reconnect um, the impact of what was happening and, and kind of make people look down upon, you know, physically or um, visually look down upon the event that had happened um, and, and make, but also at the same time make it feel like a more intimate event. So for her, the special theme was a sense of in-betweenness for the viewer. The viewer is seeing, in this case of a satellite imagery, it's not limitless and it's, it's not a bird's eye view. You don't feel kind of completely separated from the context. Um, and so this exhibit showed that one of the biggest questions that emerged after 9-11 today, 9-11, uh, um, sorry, the, um, the text here got a bit blown up here. Yeah. There we go, it's a little bit better. Um, uh, why this happened, it's still, that's, technology can't answer that question for us. So um, satellite images, um, they kind of give you this visual of what happened on the, um, down below, but you need to still reconnect with that. So that was her um, exhibit. Another one I wanted to show is um, one that I look at a lot. It's an atlas of Washington at the time of the Civil War. Uh, so this one was uh, funded by uh, grants that came in through the University of Nebraska. So this project examined the U.S. national capital from multiple perspectives, social, political, cultural, and also medical and um, spiritual in the, in the, um, in the sense of um, location of churches and places of worship during the Civil War. And so you, in this case, you have scholars from multiple backgrounds coming together to build this atlas. And also thinking about why that atlas is important to them. Like, what do they want to learn from this atlas? Um, so the material that they used to fill in the information came from census records, from literary texts, um, and, uh, and also just other, all other types of records. Some of them from people we think of as famous now versus data that uh, in, this, in a lot of census was long forgotten. So um, here um, is the, just a kind of screenshot. But again, you can go here to Civil War Washington, and you can look at the maps. But notice that the site is a portal to all of the other scholarly information. So in a sense, this is both an exhibit and an archive, uh, which is, uh, to, to me, quite important to the work I do. So the map represents a kind of visual interpretation, and it gets, gives you access to the other materials that are here. Let's see. OK, it should load in a second. It's a map with a lot of layers to it, so it always takes a minute or two to load. Hello, map. I'm having the same. Okay, yeah, it's taking a very long time, so we'll let it sit there for a little while and see what happens. I'll come back to it later. I've loaded it before, and it's not. Yes, it's never taken quite that long before. One of the 
constant challenges with having material in an online exhibit or archive is you have to make sure that the online part is up and functioning if you want to get access to things. So how is that server doing? Okay, a couple of examples from my work in linguistics. Uh, these are not my maps, by the way. These are just um, maps and atlases I take um, inspiration from. So because I do language documentation work, I'm always very interested in how other people who do documentation and description work um, visualize, particularly spatially, the kind of information they're getting. So this is a place names atlas. Again, this is what a lot of people um, who took that Summer Institute course with me were interested in. They were interested in generating their own space, uh, place names atlas for um, land, land in Alaska. This one loads. And again, you have these different layers that are made available. Whoops, sorry. It's kind of all or nothing here with the Zoom right now. <laughs> yeah. And so you can view, you can view the um, native, uh, so this is uh, Micmac. You can view the native Micmac uh, term for the uh, place name. And you can also click different layers to turn on the English interpretation of that place name. And also um, kind of uh, people were interviewed to find out where the boundaries are for those particular places as well. So I won't go through all of the layers here, but you can just kind of see what they've done with this. Um, so there's that example. And then um, this one I like because it also incorporates audio. So this is looking at what is a proposed and for linguists as a linguistic area. And a linguistic area in our field is an area where you have extreme uh, language mixing and so a high degree of extreme language contact and the languages that mix with each other have to come from different genealogical affiliations so they have to be distinct enough with each other from each other that they're not related and so um, you have different linguistic areas proposed in different parts of the world and so here they're looking at the kind of intersection of um, Oops, Let's see, what are the languages here? Oh, it's also in English and French, what I think, which I think is kind of interesting. Here we go. Yeah, Algonquian, lang Algonquian languages, French, English, and then also a mixed language that's uh, kind of born out of contact between French and Algonquian languages. So um, looking at this, we can say, um, how do you say, for example, this is my mother? in this language. So the, these are different semantic categories. You can have ter, uh, phrases and words for family or greetings or numbers or days and so on and so forth. And then the different phrases that are associated with those different semantic fields. So um, this represents, um, here's the legend here. Yeah. So we have varieties of Cree being spoken here. Michif is the mixed language um, and uh, other um, local languages as well. So, uh, for example, in Plains Cree, sorry, the volume isn't so good. Yeah, so. And then you can compare that phrase structure and also sounds to other varieties of Cree. Um, so that is Plains Cree. Let's see if we've got. Notice ama in there. So now um, French or English is being brought into that structure. Again, ama is showing up in there. Okay, that one's completely different. And just in case you're wondering how it sounds in English, this is my mother. <laughs> and then how it sounds in French. Yeah. So again, one can go through. So in this sense, it's visualizing variation in how people produce language, how they produce sounds, how they produce syntactic structure by the different languages and varieties in the region. That was something that I really wanted to work towards. That's why this atlas, in some ways, was particularly important to me. And then another very cool atlas I'll show, and then um, in a moment I'll just launch into my own demo. This is, 
This is a slightly different way of thinking about language and geography. Rather than showing um, kind of indigenous or native languages of a region, this map asks, who uses what language where? So in, anywhere in the world, uh, and this is a kind of crowd, crowd, I would say crowdsourced or crowd-constructed atlas. Anybody can offer in their data. You have to pass through a couple of like checks first to make sure you're not going to um, spam the system or try to sell blue jeans or something on the system. But anybody can offer in their own audio recordings of where they live and what language they're using and what location they live in. So this, this project was started in the UK. So understandably, most of the um, data points that you find are in, in the UK. So you know, in the UK alone, if you see an X here, that means that there's lots and lots and lots and lots of contributions. And it was actually particularly started in London. It was started at the School of Oriental and African Studies. So um, in, in and around London, you have most of the entries. So it's kind of actually useful to zoom out and go to a place where there aren't so many. It, once you click on an area, uh, the, the sidebar will update and you see the different options that are available to you. Um, but um, so in the UK, a lot of people who offer their entries are speaking English, understandably. But if you go into London, you see a lot more multilingualism in terms of what people offer. You'll hear Russian, you'll hear Italian, you'll hear Polish being spoken there. I went to the US just very quickly to see what people were offering from the US. I went over to Montana. Um, and there's a nice Nez Perce recording here. deals with how Coyote encounters a baby on the trail uh, who turns out to be a killer and murders him. Oh no, because it's a guy and he told by it's a baby walk. We got it some. So somebody donated, presumably their grandparents, Nez Perce storytelling and said, here's a language of Montana. Here's at least what people were speaking in Montana. So. The sad part is that this doesn't have a transcript that goes with it, you know, so I'm hearing Nez Perce, but I have no idea what she's saying in the story. So that's, you know, but again, atlases don't offer everything. They are a visualization, you know, that are, is partly inspired by the choice of, you know, their developer who, who's behind this. Um, so I just wanted to kind of show off our atlas very briefly before I turn very quickly to the mapping apps that I just wanted to demonstrate to you. Um, is that the, yeah, um, yeah. So um, our atlas um, was um, inspired by my work with um, Dr. Shem Kibu, who's a faculty member, professor in the geography department here. And so um, I kind of told him about the ideas I had about the work I was doing in a certain part of Nepal where I work. And I said, look, I'm working in a highly multilingual area. There's a lot of, there are a lot of languages spoken in a concentrated area. There's a lot of language contact. And many um, of the languages are um, indigenous minority languages, which have very small speech communities, in some cases, just a couple of hundred speakers. And in, in addition, the national language, Nepali, is, um, is having an increased presence in the region through a variety of different entryways, schools, administrative development, road building was one of the big things I was interested in. And also English is starting to make an appearance in this part of the world too. So I wanted to better understand the dynamics in interplay uh, across these different speech communities. Um, I wanted to understand this from a kind of larger socio-linguistic perspective. And of course, the, the, um, the grammar writer in me also wanted to find out kind of who, you know, how does somebody pronounce the word for dog in this village versus that village? So what kind of dialect variation and so on and so forth. So we designed a kind of repeat design study that we carried through every village in this part of the, um, of the country that we were working in. So some 30 to 40 odd villages that we went through. Uh, it took us three summers to work through these different areas of Nepal. So for three summers, it was really tough. We had to spend our summers in Nepal gathering this data. And Dr. Hu came with his, um, a video recorder that was um, uh, geotag enabled. And we also, you know, if you have an iPhone with you or something, as long as you have um, some kind of satellite access, you can also geotag the photos. That's actually hard in some parts of Nepal, believe it or not, there, there is no, there are no towers. There's no phone towers and no satellite access in some places, so there are still gaps. But um, there were areas where we could get this. 
And so, um, and then when we returned from our field work, we said, okay, let's, let's, um, let's represent this geospatially. Uh, so uh, what are we gonna say? What, is our, what kind of story is our map going to tell us? Um, or what kind of stories might an atlas tell us? So um, a lot of this uh, came about also because we had um, access to awesome grad assistants who came out of, the, of computer science and helped us with a lot of the web development and the map app enhancement. So I'm trying to go home, sorry. It's Friday. Yeah, so this is our home, project homepage. And if you go directly to the Atlas, um, here is what we have, a kind of homepage view of the Atlas. And each of these points is interactive. So you can click on these and get a variety of information about the location where, um, you know, a picture of the area where the data were taken uh, other, other types of images that can be downloaded. Um, linguistic information can be downloaded often in the form of PDFs. And in some of these cases, it also takes you to um, a video, an archive video. This video is ar archived at the University of Virginia, actually, that has um, a, um, a person telling a story with a transcription of that storytelling. So a nice example of this would be, let's see, further south. Each of the colors of the points represents different languages. Not that one, let's zoom in a little bit more. This was actually made with um, a Google map base. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to show you. That must be this guy. Again, everything's taking a really long time to load today because I'm up here on the clock. I'm having the same time. <laughs> okay. Okay, yes. So unfortunately, I'm in this video. I didn't want to be, but um, it was a very spontaneous story that this gentleman is telling us about um, his apple orchard. And so um, I just have, I, I feel a little bit like a reporter. And of course, I'm just dressed, I'm dressed to the hike on the trail. We were, we were about to leave at that point. So um, that's a bit unfortunate. And the nice thing here is that you do have a transcript and a translation in this timeline. So you can follow along with the man's speech and uh, read his English translation. Doctor Who is behind the camera. He's speaking Guru. Shao is the word for Apple. Anyways, so, so this atlas here has a lot more interactive features to it. And as I mentioned earlier, um, it also has informed a particular study that Chen Fu and I did um, on um, people's attitudes and reported practices of languages in this area. So now in this layer of the map, the different points correspond with quest interview questions that we pose to uh, residents of the region about which languages they report speaking, for example, at home. Everybody here is multilingual. So which language do you speak with your wife or husband if you're married? What language did you speak with your parents growing up if you were around your parents? If you have kids, what language do you speak with your kids? What languages do you speak at work? What languages do you speak if you're just out and about moving around in your village on a daily basis? Um, how important do you think Nepali is to um, kind of your, your life, your, your working life? How important is your local language to cultural celebrations? We had a whole series of questions that we sat down and asked people in a re repeat design method. So basically you can have a look at the way that people responded. So here's a kind of interesting question. Um, do you think that the inclusion or addition of your mother tongue to a local school curriculum would be helpful or hurtful to children? So we wanted to ask the local people, because these, school, these languages are not taught in schools currently, but it's kind of a topic of discussion. So in this case, um, in this part of the world, it's often the case that the um, addition of schools to an area hurts the mother tongues because it's imposing the national language um, on younger speakers and shutting out the local languages. So we wanted to know what people thought about that. And so basically um, the responses are coded by the types of, um, the, the points are coded by the types of responses that people give. 
And so obviously this data can then be exported into a kind of Excel or comma separated value format where you can start to run um, different types of like regression or correlative types of analyses to find out are people from one part of the area more likely to have a kind of response than people from another area? Are mother tongue speakers of one language going to have a particular type of response as opposed to other types of languages and so on and so forth? And we were able to find some significant patterns. In particular, one of the things that we found, and this is a paper that Shang Fu and I published together, is that people who live closer to the motor road have profoundly different opinions. I mean, not surprisingly, but it's statistically backed up. They have profoundly different opinions and reported practices of the dominant language as opposed to people who live further and further away from the motor road. So it really shows a significant impact of this new motor road on people's daily positioning of themselves vis-a-vis -vis their local languages, vis-a-vis -vis Nepali. So in this case, then, the map really does kind of influence um, uh, and, and help direct the, um, our, our scholarship and the types of activities that we do. Okay, so that's me showing off maps. Um, there's just a few minutes left, so I just br briefly wanted to show you. Um, um, oh, there's, yeah, you have the handout, Steve. Okay, good. A couple of apps in case people are wondering, oh, you know, I'd like to make a map like that. I'd like to make a mashup map that brings in video or audio or still images. I thought I would just kind of quickly show you that there are these two options out there. How many of you have built a map on Google Maps before? Yeah, okay, so, yeah, so I'll at least show you very quickly how to get started. Um, I think for, for um, as I mentioned at the start of the talk, since a lot of these apps now require you to subscribe and pay, even Mapbox, which is the other app I'm going to show you, only lets you go so far before you have to pay. For example, you can only generate your map as an image to use in a paper, I think up to five times before you have to start paying. So it's really quite limited in that. So really the best bet for a lot of people who want to dip their toes into online map ma making is still Google Maps. So just in case you're kind of you know, curious about how to get started, you just simply type my, my maps, but if you have a Google account, you, it should be um, one of the options when you log into your Gmail or something. And then my maps, so this one, it remembers me because this is my laptop. So basically you can generate a new map um, and it just gives you a base map to start with. Um, now sometimes people will just go in and start manually dropping points in parts of the world that they think are interesting places. So for example, maybe you want to make a map of your favorite Thai restaurants in St. Louis or something like this. You just go in, you can zoom in and zoom in and zoom in until you get to that place. Um, or you can type in a postcode or an address and Google Maps will find that location for you. And you can start manually dropping pins. So by dropping pins, I mean you click here. at It's called a marker in, in Google Maps. And it will drop these markers in locations. And then you can, you can title your map and you can share it. You, you, maybe you want to send around a link to your friends and say, if you ever go for Thai food in St. Louis, I recommend these places. And it will automatically show the map that you've created with your favorite, favorite places. And so that's, that's a fine way to use Google Maps. Um, typically what I'm doing in my own research is um, if I'm working with ty on typology, which is the cross-linguistic comparison of, of features across many, many languages, I want to show those, those languages and the features that I'm thinking about on a map um, before a conference talk or something like that. So in that case, I may have already um, gathered the latitude and longitude, the coordinates of where those languages are spoken. And typically, you can put them into an, like an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. And you can upload that. And that will create a layer. It adds a layer to your map. So um, actually, if you want to try this at home, um, I have a um, couple of links here on our IRIS page. So if you click on Workshops, and you click on my talk, digital map making, I have um, some sample map data. And I also have a sample JPEG image here. So I'll show you, you, know, you can upload an image to your different map points as well. So you can kind of start mashing up web links and images and so on and so forth. I won't go through all of this too, too much today because we're gonna have to end in a couple of minutes, but that's why I created the handout for you. And maybe then I'll also make this handout available on our, our IRIS page as well which walks you more carefully through the different steps that I'm kind of quickly walking you through today. So you can go to your map, untitled map. You can um, import 
a layer. Uh, so, I, and it says it will um, accept these types of form, file formats. So XLSX is just the newer version of Excel. If your computer doesn't have the newer version of Excel, then I recommend you go in and um, save as, basically resave your Excel file as a CSV, comma separated value format. Excel will yell at you and say, oh no, no, why do you wanna do that? Why are you messing with a good thing? Let's just keep it XLS. But you can just override that and save it as a, a CSV format and um, Google Maps will upload it for you. So let's see, uh, where did I put this? I've done so many different things today that I've had so many different folders open. Uh, map data, there we go, thanks. So it uploads it. And it says, uh, which columns do you want to position? So what, um, it's gonna look, it's automatically gonna look for latitude and longitude. That's typically how people name their columns that have the latitude, latitude coordinates and longitude. So yep, that's what I want. And then um, what, to pick a title for the place marks, I don't know, I'll just call, I'll call it language. That way we can see it by language. And now if I'm lucky, if I uploaded everything correctly, it should take me to the part of the world where I want to be. And guess what? What a surprise. These are all languages of South Asia. Who, who knew that Dr. Hildebrandt would make you look at a map of South Asia, right? So here, this is a sample of languages that you know, I'm looking at in a study, a different kind of a study that I'm doing. This is not just language documentation. This is other stuff right now. So right now, all of the points are the same color, and there's no interesting labels or anything to them. So you can go in, and you can customize that. So for example, you can um, have a look at, uh, let's see, um, here. Click uniform style. Yeah, where am I? Yeah, there we go, thank you. Uh, so I want to group them by type right now because that's kind of what I'm interested in is what language shows what type of linguistic pattern. Uh, so now that automatically is differentiating the uh, points by color. So some languages are green and some are blue and some are orange based on some kind of pattern that they exhibit. And I wanna add labels. I just want people to know what language names are there. Uh, this is a problem with Google Maps. They don't really um, give, you can't really um, easily manipulate the font and clarity of the language names. I believe you could go in and do some customization, however, where you could map customization if you know enough about going in and modifying um, um, the source code to change how those uh, labels are displayed. Uh, but now what I've got at least is um, my, my different, my set of languages according to their type and with their labels being shown. And then, you know, very finally, one thing I can do before I, I wrap things up is I can go to, here's Manange, here's um, kind of my favorite language. I can now, I can customize this point if I'd like. Let me put a picture in. So, and then I've got the image here that um, I want to add, and I also put that image on our iris site. So the image is here. This is actually a picture of Lanang Village, where many speakers live. There we go. And I could add a URL if I want to take people to a web page about Manang. Uh, so let me save that. That's fine. Uh, so whenever people hover over or click the link, they'll see this nice image here. Um, you can actually add images that are in your Google Shared Photos folder. Um, there's a little trick there. You have to, you have to say, copy the, the correct image URL or else the picture won't um, show. So in the directions that I have here, I have kind of some specifics on how to capture that image correctly. And then you can take the data that you're working with here and you can also bring them into Google Earth. And Google Earth lets you do other types of uh, things with um, the information, with the data, and with the points. Um, uh, other things you can do with Google Maps is you can connect points uh, with lines, and so that can, for, you know, for example, that can show you driving time. Driving time is irrelevant for most of the part of the world that I work in. It's true that there is a motor road that's gone in in Nepal, but really what that does is it takes a two-day walk and turns it into a bone-cracking, um, life risking, you know, 16 hour drive. So, you know, it's not really, the road is kind of a road in, in that kind of loose sense of the word. So driving time doesn't really make a lot of sense um, 
uh, in Nepal. And in fact, as I argue in the paper that Shenfu and I wrote, time between X and Y is not a useful concept for a lot of people in that part of the world. They, they, they don't really talk about, oh, it took me two hours to walk, or I, if that's, a, that's a five mile walk. They, they kind of, um, they, they judge the, the distance, they judge distance in different ways in that part of the world, so. Okay, yeah, I don't, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm not gonna get into Mapbox, but again, I think the notes that I've got here for you will give you an idea of how to get started. Um, otherwise, thank you for coming to my talk today, and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. And cut. Yeah, I have a bit oh, yeah, sure. Um, how do you recommend saving the, what you generate with Google My Maps? Yeah, well, that's a really good point, and that's I, I closed out of the internet too fast. So um, it will just automatically save your map as an untitled map until you choose to delete it. So it'll be there for you when you come back. You can give it a title. If you want to export the image to use in a paper that you're writing or something like that, there are some um, export and print options, none of which I like. So that's one real drawback to Google Maps. I don't like any of the image export options. So my advice is actually to take a screenshot of your map and save it as a JPEG or PNG or something like that and use that image. What I don't like about the export feature of Google Maps is that it exports the legend in a very dominant way that really kind of eats up. So often when I'm making a map, I really want people to look at the map. And I, it's not that I don't want a legend, but I don't want the legend to be such a dominant image um, part of the map. I want it to be kind of positioned differently. And Google Maps gives you virtually no flexibility in terms of positioning of the legend. So that's one of the reasons why I don't like it. And also I believe that when you um, export it as an image, it, it zooms out a bit. So when I've got the map to a, a zoom in, projection that I'm comfortable with. That's what I like. That's what I want to save as an image. So I don't know why the program goes ahead and then makes new decisions for me upon export. I don't want it doing that. So now um, Mapbox has more sophisticated export options, but you can only do it four times and after that you have to pay. So I accidentally um, exported a map without thinking about it and it wasn't any good. And so now I'm down to um, four more times before I have to pay. So I like wasted my free, one free export by doing it wrong. So. Like a genie, but yeah. Luckily for me as an individual, I still have free access to CartoDB mm -hmm. because I got grandfathered in before they started throwing up the paywall. So I'm glad, but I'm also annoyed that other people have to pay now. So. Yeah, Greg. Let's say I would like to make a map for a cartographer to re-render professionally for publication. Mm -hmm. Would Google Maps be a good way for me to make that sort of mock-up map? And if so, mm -hmm. um, and I've even put I have put Google Maps into publications as well. Yeah. So maybe, maybe I could yeah. make it look good myself. Um, yeah. I, I was interested if Google Maps would be a good option for such a purpose. And if so, rather than well, you said a screenshot would provide mm -hmm. a good copy. Am I? That would mean that cartographer would have to start all over. You can share your map with your cartographer friend. Useful that would yeah. import into a actual cartography program. Yes. So for, first of all, you can share your map with them. Um, so you can make your map shareable, and you can make it shareable with the world, or you can make it shareable with only a set of audiences. Um, but I believe they have to have a Google account to access it. Um, and then by that, you're also sharing with them any spreadsheets, any data sets that you've also uploaded to create new layers. And so I'm sure that that's something they would also want to have as well. Yeah, that way they're not recreating it. And so even if they decide that this Google Maps that they're working with is very rudimentary compared to the great power of uh, ArcGIS or something like that, they at least have your coordinates in the in the layer file that yeah in the data file. Mm -hmm. yes. Are all your workshops uh, <laughs> recorded? Yep. Yes. They're on. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so the digital storytelling one is already up. Yep, and then, um, oh yeah, I'm giving the next one too. I'm giving one on um, atlases online. I'm sorry, online, I just gave the one on saying atlases. It's time to go home. Uh, on archives, on digital archives. So I'll do that one next time. Yeah, week. every workshop that we've done since January of last year is on our website. Mm -hmm. If you just go to our yeah. website, it is all scholarly.
Yeah, and it, yeah, all different aspects. Often, like just intro, very basic intros for the most part. Some are a little bit more, you know, advanced. So, really, I was thinking about this just as anybody who's never used a map making app before, come on over, and you know, you can see what's out there. And uh, why would anybody be a, but a geographer care about maps? There's lots of reasons to care about maps. Yeah. So, yeah. I can tell you what we've done in. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been a part of this, but my father's is from Jaffa, which is now mm -hmm. part of Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, people who left in 1948 have gone back and superimposed pictures of the places that they lived in. So they've created kind of a virtual Jaffa. A virtual museum. 48, right? Mm -hmm. Right on the, I mean, many of the homes that mm -hmm. are there. And so you can see what it is now. And yeah, Civil War Washington does a similar thing. It re it re um, it reanimates Washington D.C. from you know a couple of hundred years ago, but you also still have access to the modern map as well, so you can compare what's changed, what stayed the same. Well, and it's a way of reclaiming something. Yes, the place, yes. which is I mean that's what motivated people to do yeah. it. Is like, uh, yeah, I mentioned at the start of the class one one of the things that really got me into this was I taught a, a one-week um, workshop at the University of Alaska a couple of summers ago. So every other summer they have an institute called CoLang, Collaborative Language Documentation Workshop, uh, field, field school. It, it runs for um, two weeks plus some extra workshops. So I taught a one-week workshop on digital map making. And I really didn't know who I would get in the classroom, but because it was in Alaska, I had a lot of um, representatives from like the Atna community and Diné communities and these, and a lot of the people who were in the room like kind of walked up to me the first day of class and said, you know, I'm interested in um, map making for land reclamation. So they want to go to court and try to reclaim land. And so they were doing it by layer, creating layers uh, with traditional place names over um, area that, you know, had kind of U.S. place names on top. Um, to show and to, and redrawing boundaries and also areas that had been like flooded and that area showing that the land under that water was their land. And I think it would be a really interesting tool to use the power of it as like you showed that one project where just general members of the public are voting. Yes, so. and community yeah. mapping. Right, yeah. and mm -hmm. there's one, one site I really like, it's called the Confluence Project. Mm -hmm where every intersection of latitude and longitude, anybody can go and take a picture of a GPS unit, and then they take panoramic pictures, so you can go and click on any place in the world, see what it looks like. But it'd be interesting to have people load archival historic pictures of yes. places. And have you know, public contribution. A picture yeah. of a house and what it used to be, you know, because they've got all these family photographs of what places used mm -hmm. to look like, and you could click on that place and load that photograph. Mm -hmm. Know. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going back to teach this workshop again this summer, and one of the things I want to spend a little bit more time on are um, community community built online map initiatives, where where somebody designs the map, but then allows opportunity for anybody to upload, you know, as long as they go through a couple of steps first to make sure there's no kind of troublemakers out there. But and you know, it's got an interesting history, yeah. like Dudley Stamp. Yes. The first real community mm -hmm. project. Yeah. He's a, a British geographer who mm -hmm. mobilized school children mm. across the country to go out with land use, for land use surveys, where you could do that yeah. in the technological era, back in that day, it was yeah. probably technological, but it could easily be now. Yeah, exactly, where people can upload their images or their videos, or their, in the, in the case of language landscapes, their audio. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's so much information yes. in the hands of ordinary people. Yeah. That doesn't have a place to kind of go yeah. and be put within a larger context. Yeah. Yeah, these community <clears throat> constructed maps analysis. Yeah, I think that's a there's a lot of potential. That also it uh, it creates agency in people. People become a part of a project, whether it's documentation or reclamation on some of some some level. They have input, they can critique it, they give feedback. So I know that by making my oral narratives, the oral um, the discourses I showed you that quick clip of a public, I've had people come in and say, yeah, I know uncle so-and-so, and that story of our village's history is completely bogus. He's just telling you what, you know, 
you know, and I, of course, don't have a dog in that race. I'm not out, you know, to um, claim whether somebody's historical interpretation of the founding of a village is right or wrong, but it's interesting how it generates that feedback. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, something can be erased. Like, yes. A history can be, and then it can be rewritten. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, people's memories are flawed. I don't mind this. I have a recollection of some of this. That's not what happened. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's not at all what happened. Yeah. <laughs> that's my recollection. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's what I think Oftentimes, the truth lies somewhere in the combination of all those stories. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for coming today, everybody. I really appreciate it. And thanks, Wendy, for the example.